Chapter 1. Arch of Total Victory Hitler gave the push to Petra's husband, Max, in 1958. The unique vehicle made a perfect memento of the great Führer, who died within weeks of awarding it Max for his achievements as the Reich's best pilot. Max checked his watch, drummed his fingers on the steering wheel, then looked at the time again. Hugo Boss personally designed the suit, the uniform that Max wore, and Max looked every bit the honoured guest at Berlin's May Day Parade. Petra put the phone down. From their villa's doorway, she teetered over to the five-year-old car, looking to the eastern skies. She bumped into the passenger door, cushioned by the tool beneath her taffeta dress. Entering the ride, she straightened out her, the, the black ruffles and smoothed the headscarf, protecting her dark beehived hair, all the while facing east. Max touched her stocking knee as he changed gear. What are you looking for? he asked. Petra checked the back seat and passed their four-year-old a toy. Lothar, here, play with Daddy's spaceship. That ensured he paid their conversation no mind. Keeping the talk confidential, she looked east again. Siegfried just called. He said the insurgents ambushed one of the pending patrolling missiles and there's a battle to take it back. It could be launched at any minute. You won't see that coming, declared Max. Well, not so you'll be able to get away with, from it. We'll be all right as long as we're a block away from the explosion. Petra's oldest of many contacts in the fatherland was also her most valued. For those outside the SS, connections in Gothengau were difficult to make. Siegfried commanded a paratroop regiment there. They met on the boat when emigrating from America in 1945. 18 months later, at the height of the final solution, Petra's olive skin got her rounded up from a Hamburg street. It didn't help that her identity papers were in another coat. Siegfried happened to be at the station and vouched for her Aryan purity. Afterwards, Siegfried made his feelings about the Holocaust clear to her. His Amish upbringing guaranteed his silent opposition to the genocide. Petra caught Max staring east for longer than he needed to. You said there's no point looking out for a rocket, she said. He smiled when he answered. It's hard to ignore 15 years of pilot training. Petra held Max's hand, appreciating his protect protective side. He gazed, she gazed at his blonde, slick back hair, blue eyes and prominent cheekbones. Max had arrogant moments and he could be flippant, but she couldn't help but be proud of him. Sometimes, when his eye didn't rove over every beautiful woman, she even loved him. For the next 20 minutes, silence reigned in the car. They arrived in Berlin's new monumental center Crown jewel, the Volkshalle, had a thousand foot dome that could be seen for miles. The Reich's capital dwarfed Paris, Rome and London. Cool shade greeted their entry into the car park beneath the main square. The family emerged from the parking garage behind the massive dais, constructed across the base of the Volkshalle. A platform with pulpit and microphone stood at the end of the catwalk jutting from the first row. Petra looked down the boulevard of splendours at the arch of total victory, Berlin's South Railway Station, and at the screens relaying images from the stage. Tens of thousands of people filled the enormous boulevard. The ranks of men and women wore SS uniforms, held runic banners and Nazi standards, and stood at attention. Around tanks, cannons and rockets, they gave the straight arm salute and repeatedly, in unison, cried, Heil Himmler! Max sat at the front. Petra and their adopted son sat in the second row. The Luftwaffe Air Marshal, all rugged good looks and fair hair, turned his, to wink at her. She rolled her eyes, familiar with his persistent flirtations. Give it a rest, Fritz, she whispered. Max met her eye when turning to his colleague Eva Reich, whose beauty threatened Petra. The head of the army greeted Petra with a nod and an intense stare. The Navy Supreme Roma remained motionless, his rough pitted skin giving him a stone-hewn appearance. Behind the dais, 
she saw a military radio set with several adjutants buzzing around it. The equipment broadcast a gun battle before a sheepish officer muted it. Another soldier pushed a cameraman to the ground and kicked him. When the Führer stood, the noise of the crowd ceased. Himmler remained on his feet for several seconds before speaking. Aryan people of the Reich, I stand before you today with High Priest Drachenblut, the leaders of our glorious colonies of Ingermanland and Memel Narev, and also Gothengau. Petra sensed there must be a discord between the Führer and Gothengau leader Richard Bayer. She couldn't account for another reason why the Führer would demote the colony from its customary first place in the introductions. Bayer's clenched jaw reinforced Petra's intuition. Himmler nodded to the, to the group on his left. Our spiritual leader and the Vestal Virgins are here to perform the blessings of spring in the manner of our ancient Germanic forefathers. The Führer looked to his right. The Wehrmacht chiefs, Western defenders of, of, the, of the Fatherland, Air Marshal von Hohenzollern, Field Marshal Manteuffel and Admiral Geisler offer us their support through their defence against Britain and America. It struck Petra that the emphasis on the armed forces over Gothengau and the failure to mention their status as Eastern defenders meant that relations had hit rock bottom. Maybe relations were even more strained than after the Battle of Saratov when bureaucracy and hubris lost a battalion. It must be connected to the rocket, she concluded. Himmler continued addressing the crowd. But first, I will tell you something. I'll tell you how the Reich Space Agency will take a leap in technology further than America, Britain or Japan have ever dreamed. I am excited. Today I let it be known that the Fatherland will be the first nation to put a man in space. Yes, through the brilliance of our scientists, we can truly be above all. As rulers of the skies, this is the first step for the Aryan people to continue their natural domination from planet Earth into other worlds. We shall colonize and populate the moon, Mars, the cold outer reaches of the solar system, then the stars. First, we shall send the foremost specimens of Ar the Aryan race to take that crucial initial leap. They must be strong in mind and body skilled aviators, and at the pinnacle of their generation. Who will be the first? The hero of the battle for Russian skies, the first to break the speed of sound and pride of the fatherland, Max Dietrich. Max stood and bowed. In the moments of relative silence between the speeches and their matching rounds of applause, Petra monitored the panic radio officers. Himmler gave a typically long address, further detailing his plans for the Third Reich's domination of space. Werner von Braun, rocket pioneer and visionary, had his accomplishments usurped, but his expression didn't betray his disappointment. When not looking at the radio set, Petra watched out for the rocket. Max did too. Himmler neared the end of the speech. I give you my word that we will, by the middle of this decade, put a man in space. We do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, and one we are unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. The audience responded with deafening, almost seismic applause. Little Lothar trembled on Petra's knee. Himmler held his hands high, basking in the adulation before ceding the podium to the high priest. Drachenblut rose. His six and a half foot frame loomed over Petra. He breezed past the dais sentries with a few long strides, then turned, cloak arcing in the air. The silver threads in the embroidery glinting in the sunshine, his boots Trousers and tunic mimicked the ancient Teutonic style, but were in remodeled into the fearsome, stylish SS clerical uniform. 
The three vestal virgins rose at his beckoning, snaking towards him in a line. Their powder blue, billowing silk robes appeared to conjoin them. The colour of their coiled, braided hair, their only distinguishing feature. They bent down and picked up the pole lying on the runway, seductively raising it and placing it in its socket on the podium. Red-headed Helga, daughter of the, the chief festival and daughter of the propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, stepped forward, indicating her importance. Grimhilt, the blonde vestal, remained still. Edda, mouth perpetually agape, stepped back to reflect her place in the hierarchy. Petra couldn't resist looking at the huge figure of the high priest. Her skin tingled, feeling his messianic presence. She felt like this once before, when the SS accidentally rounded her up for a train heading to Auschwitz. The May Day fertility blessing started, with Drakenblood raising Helga's leg and running his hand along her bare thigh. She coiled and uncoiled her leg around him, then flung herself over to the blue and white maypole. Grimhilt replaced Helga as the high priest dancing partner. While Helga wrapped herself around the maypole, spinning and dancing up and down around it. Petra stopped thinking about rocket attacks and started thinking back to five years earlier. The onset of these lewd annual occult performances introduced by Drakenblood. Himmler had just elevated him to defender of the German faith. Drakenblood used the time to shape Odinism to suit his own fantasies. May Day blessings were just titillating theatrics. Back in America, women had started calling for liberation from hearth, home and child rearing. Gothengau men, who were well connected or had distinguished themselves in battle, were allowed, even encouraged, to take two wives. Petra wished she could change the situation somehow introduce equality of the sexes to the fatherland. Petra snapped out of her thoughts when one of the officers from the radio installation abandoned his post to run up the stairs towards the Führer. He whispered the message into Himmler's ear, then the Führer trotted to the steps. Richard Bayer, the Gothengau leader, followed instantly. Petra jumped, almost knocking her son to the floor. Lothar dropped the toy spaceship, smashing it to pieces. She ignored his screams and leant forward to Max. I think the rocket's coming. Look at the Führer! Jealousy stung Petra, when Max answered by grasping Eva's thigh and whispering in her ear. Eva jumped up and ran to the stairs and Max followed her. Petra picked up Lothar, but by now almost half the guests had moved to the exit, keeping her apart from Max. On stage, Drakenblood disentangled himself from the Vestals to watch the mass exodus. If the crowd received no warning of the attack, the rocket strike could kill many thousands. Petra let those behind her push past, jumped over Hitler to Himmler's empty chair and grabbed the microphone. She would do something for the people of the Reich, even if their leaders wouldn't. Run, run, she shouted crowd showed no movement. Run! A rocket's coming! Run now! On the Grand Boulevard, the ordered ranks of demonstrators became a crazed mob. The people at its edges through the, ran through the rockets and tanks onto the side streets, but the artillery caused bottlenecks and halted their exit. The thousands more Nazis behind them, escaping from the centre, ran until those who had stopped were pushed over and the stampede ground its boots on them. Petra stood between a mob and the stairs along the dais. She grabbed Lothar and got swept along in the crush. Petra carried the boy and the crowd carried them. Down the stairs they went, Lothar's face pressed to her chest by the pressure of the horde. Petra couldn't free him. She worried the boy would suffocate, but they were quickly spewed onto the ground and he gasped for air. Petra stood close to the stage, looking down the boulevard at the melee. The crowd kicked one of the Himmler youth out from under it, but the body's battered, bloody condition meant its gender couldn't be determined. 
When Petra ran for cover, she glimpsed Max and Eva running to the massive Hitler statue that disguised a car park entrance. Petra bolted towards it, pulling Lothar behind her so hard he flew up in the air. Or maybe that's how it felt in the orange and yellow tinged confusion. The marble statue of the great Führer, ten times his size and arm out in a salute, sheltered Petra from the explosion, but poor Lothar never knew Hitler's shadow. He was torn from her hand by the blast. Petra turned as Lothar's body smashed against a wall, his crumpled form sliding to the floor. He lay motionless and she picked him up. Now she had lost two children. The mourning she had for Lothar got brushed aside by the harrowing death of Wieland. Lothar had been passed on to them after that tragedy. The miscarriages Petra suffered caused Max's attentions to wander more than usual. The affairs became too public for a hero like Max, so the Reich looked, took Lothar from a breeding program and pushed him onto them as their adopted child. Ears ringing, Petra followed Max and Eva to the car park, st stepping around the Hitler head and arm, the explosion thrown to the ground. She opened the door <coughs> and rushed downstairs. When she reached the parking level, shock caught up with her. She collapsed over the dead child, tears and sobs bursting from her. All became dark and she slipped out of consciousness. Petra checked her watch when her eyes opened again. She'd been out only for a couple of minutes. She picked up Lothar's corpse and staggered towards the car, desperate to avoid the carnage outside as well as unfaithful, fickle Max. She staggered to the vehicle raising herself with every step. When she regained her erect posture, their Porsche became visible. She shuffled towards it and saw the car shaking, shaking with Max and Eva's passion. Petra recognized Max's grunts and knew the coupling had ended. She couldn't understand how he or Eva, or Eva could start an affair while she and Lothar could be dead outside. Eva looked shocked when she caught Petra's eyes through the window. She wriggled and Max looked around at his wife. The lovers scrabbled around with their clothing to cover their modesty, then left the car. Petra stared at Eva, who recoiled when she saw the boy's limped body, then she ran away weeping. Petra felt a tear emerge too. Eva at least had a conscience and some shame. Max's stoop and haunted expression showed his guilty feelings. But Petra's remorse but for Petra, remorse wasn't enough to pay for the hurt that she'd received. Petra handed Lothar's body to him. He needs the burial ceremony, she said. Take him to the children's Valhalla temple. Petra got in the car and drove up to the street. The day's events hadn't broken her spirits. They had fired them. There must be something that she can do about this attack on the heart of the Reich. Tonight, she'd return her old friend Siegfried's call and find out what else he knew. She needed his strength, his presence now, and a battalion of paratroopers he commanded. Thank you.